Hello, and thanks for tuning in to the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I'm Jocker Rogers at Channel's Television here in Lagos, and I'm joined by my colleague from The Voice of America in Washington. Thanks. I'm Vincent McCorry at The Voice of America. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Jocker Rogers in Lagos brings you that story. The Nigerian government has affirmed its commitment to deeper internet connectivity for the nation with the release of 46.1 billion naira to be spent on 113 interventions in high institutions, airports and small businesses across the country. The Minister of Communications and Digital Economy, Mr. Ali Pantami, gave this information during a press conference in Abuja, the nation's capital. The Minister of Communications and Digital Economy, Mr. Isa Pantami, is here to meet with representatives of tertiary institutions, the aviation sector and small business owners who are to benefit from 113 interventions of the federal government for broadband and internet connectivity. For years, poor digital access has been a concern across sectors in the country. And so 49 higher institutions, 20 airports and six small businesses will partake in this first and second phase. We are happy that internet and other associated infrastructure uh, are now being made available to universities free of charge. For the second phase, we have 49 institutions, 20 airports, and six markets benefiting. The federal government is to spend about 46.1 billion naira on these interventions. All in all, we can safely say that from this number, we have 113 interventions. 19 universities in the first one, one college of education, 20 markets, 49 additional higher institutions of learning, also six additional markets and 20 airports. You can safely say we have 113 interventions so far from the 41.6 billion naira to be spent as part of our donation to other sectors from our internally generated revenue through the telecommunications of sector. We are having a lot of challenges with broadband providers across the airport because people come with different capacities, different promises. But when you engage, you find that sometimes it's 20% of what is promised. But I think with this, coming from the Honorable Minister and the Federal Government of Nigeria itself, this is a real thing. Broadband internet connectivity will ease operations in the aviation sector enhance research and studying in the nation's tertiary institutions. It would also make it a lot easier for businesses in Nigeria to connect with others across the globe. Let's get more on this. Joining me on Africa 54 today is Jude Kolawale, co-founder and CEO of Founding Networks. Glad to have you today on the program. Hello, uh, thanks for having me. Right. So let's begin. Achieving 70% to 100% broadband penetration by 2025 has been a major target of this administration. How well do you think this intervention will help facilitate it? Um, th thank you very much. I think that this approach that has been taken by the federal government is uh, crucial and critical. Uh, it's, it achieves a number of things. One, it provides the example that we need for digital penetration within public institutions. So you see a situation where uh, the public institutions that we have are already uh, digitally connected. Institutions like the airports, uh, the hospitals, uh, the universities, tertiary institutions. And this helps to lay the background for uh, the kind of internet penetration that the government wants to see. Much more important is also that there is a lot of activities that go with citizens wanting to access government services. Uh, there's a lot of research, for example, I, I work currently with CC Hub uh, with higher education institutions uh, practice. And one of the critical ways we're looking to leverage innovation for solving African problems is through the universities. A lot of research and development already goes on within that space that you want to see impacting on the economy. And having this kind of budget dedicated to 
uh, internet penetration or internet facilities within that space is, is something I think is a uh, is a good approach to it. You go to a couple of other countries, for example, the UK spends upwards of 10 billion euros, 10 billion pounds rather, right, on uh, internet and communications for public institutions on a yearly basis. So this is a step in the right direction. I, I think that it's going to deepen that um, goal of internet penetration and digital economy for our country. And so the issue of adequate infrastructure is quite critical to this. How do you think the funds will help effectively uh, deploy this achieve, uh, this uh, pro project? Yeah, and I think that that's another part of the conversation. So you see, for example, that the broadband plan um, from 2021 to 2026 that was released by the ministry also has goals around how do we lay the infrastructure to help us deep in uh, internet penetration within these institutions. So you see states, for example, outside of Lagos, Abuja, Puerto Rico, or some of our major cities like Kano, Kaduna, uh, it is very difficult for you to see that there is the infrastructure that really helps broadband penetration in some states, like Ikiti State, for example, um, or, or um, Bayosa or Taraba. So there is that conversation around how do we get that infrastructure penetrating within the countries, within the states rather. Ocean State recently just announced uh, a, a waiver of the right of way for uh, infra cable, uh, fiber optic cables being laid in the state. As part of that broadband plan, uh, there's efforts from the ministry to say, how do we help or how do we convince the states to reduce that right of way charge from as high as 4,000 naira per meter in some instances to 145 naira, right? States like Ocean State, for example, has even canceled it outright. So it is this part, is, but that conversation really then speaks to the infrastructure that helps us uh, bring high speed internet coverage to these public institutions, not just in the major cities, but in, in local government, because the hospitals, for example, are in the local governments. The primary healthcare centers are in the local governments. Uh, the universities are scattered all across the different the different um, uh, 36 states of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory. So that conversation about infrastructure also has to be going alongside dedicating this kind of budgets to covering for internet facilities. If these funds are used according to plan, of what impact should we expect? I, I think that the, the, the impact is going to be immediately obvious in, in terms of greater access especially in institutions that it is easier for us to uh, uh it is easier and effective for the government to be able to deploy these uh internet facilities so one aspect i'm even very interested in that i can basically just speak to is that the number of researchers who have to uh who work within the tertiary institutions polytechnics universities uh will no longer have to think about internet as um, a cost in helping to do their research. Uh, and this then goes a long way in improving the pace, uh, the quality of research that they do, the pace of research that they do, uh, and the kind of innovation that they can then bring forward to help uh, move the country forward. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCorry in Washington. Zimbabwe plans to build a new modern capital called Zim Cyber City that is expected to cost up to $60 billion and include new government buildings and a presidential palace. Critics are blasting the plan as a wasteful when more than half the population lives in poverty and the government has let the current capital Harare fall apart. Columbus Mavunga reports from Mount Hampton, outside the Harare, Zimbabwe's capital city. The Zimbabwe government says the community of Mount Hamden, a 30 minute drive from Harare, will be the site of Zim Cyber City, which will replace Harare as the capital and relieve some of its congestion. Some of the construction is expected to be completed by year's end. Obviously, we are building the cyber city because there's a market for it. There are Zimbabweans who can actually afford it. And we want our Zimbabweans, even those in diaspora, this is time to come back home. You, they can't continue to see the high-rise buildings in, in, in abroad and not in Zimbabwe. Some Zimbabweans in this farming area can't wait for the project to begin. When construction starts, we will be employed for some jobs. 
Others have already started building nearby, hoping to cash in by providing accommodation for the $60 billion project that UAE-based firm Mauk International is helping develop. But some Zimbabweans want President Emerson Mnangagwa to first address the country's economic problems and dilapidated power and water infrastructure. And that's not all that needs fixing, says James Nehoa, who opposes the project. It's not very wise to start by investing in Goa City when roads have not been developed yet because you find it because of the current conditions of the roads, portals and all that. It's causing accidents, damages to cars, etc. Stephen Chan, a world politics professor at the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London, is also against building Zim Cyber City in Mount Hampton. This is for the Zimbabwean elite in Mount Hampton so that the poor people won't get in their way. They can live by themselves and imagine that they're in a separate world. I think this speaks to a big division in society, which is simply not healthy for the future of Zimbabwe. That advice might be falling on deaf ears as President Emerson Mnangagwa's government seemed determined to build, saying it will help the economy and ease congestion in Harare. Plus, thanks to Chinese investment, a six-story, $140 million parliament building has already been built on the cyber city side as a gift to Zimbabwe. Columbus Mavungam for VOA News, Mount Hamden, Zimbabwe. In Uganda, urgent global crises like the war in Ukraine, the earthquake in Turkey and the drought in East Africa mean there's less food aid for people like Konga, a South Sudanese single mother living in a refugee camp in the northern part of the country. Luckily for her and others, the elements in Uganda have not been as merciless as in the Horn of Africa and rain means growth. But by how much? We'll bring you more details in this next report. Watering the neat lines of green salad leaves outside her thatched home, Susan Conga is preparing her kitchen garden for the next harvest. This year, the success of our tireless cultivation will be put to the ultimate test, complete self-sufficiency. A roughly 50% shortfall in funds this year has forced the United Nations World Food Programme, WFP, to cut off the food supply for hundreds of thousands of refugees in Uganda, the country hosting more than any other in Africa. After six years in Uganda, Conga must now rely entirely on the maize, cassava and salad leaves grown in her small vegetable patch. The abrupt change in policy will make it difficult for her to adjust. Conga worries she won't be able to grow enough surplus produce to sell to pay for her two nieces' school fees and other basic household supplies like soap. We are already aware, they already told us that we are, they are going to give food according to categories. Not everyone will get food. But my, I plead to them, they should at least give food for everyone. Since we are not yet stable, the food should continue for everyone at least for more two or three years to come. Then there at least we can, in the, next, in the, in the, in the middle, we can plan to, for what to do. WFP says vulnerable refugees such as new arrivals, the sick and elderly will continue to receive emergency food aid. But the organization's $180 million funding shortfall means others will have to be weaned off it. Some refugees who, given emergency support that they received when they came to Uganda, and this emergency support is very important because it enables a refugee to survive when they need it the most. There cannot be resilience if you do not receive emergency support when you're hit by crisis. But these people have been able to, to link into livelihood interventions, to work with our various partners and be able to stand on their own and be sustainable. And this is the third category that we shall be supporting and winning of food assistance. 
Owners are having to make very difficult decisions because uh, the needs uh, are enormous globally. Um, we of course have known for some time about the impact of the war in Ukraine. Uh, earlier this year we had the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Uh, but as far as Uganda is concerned, we're not only competing uh, for visibility on a global scale, we're competing for visibility uh, in the region as well. The rains have been good so far, but for Conga and others like her, surviving in the periods between harvest may be a struggle while they pray that rains do not fail. Electric trucks tested two years ago in rural Rwanda have quickly expanded as the fleet reduced cost and with a lower impact on the environment. Uh, the British company Ox Delivers plans to introduce newer models this year in hopes to expand further into East Africa. Sunanu Todd looks at the challenges they face. The Ox One is the second model of electric trucks tested in rural Rwanda as cleaner and cheaper transport for getting food from farms to markets. The local company running the British trucks, Ox Umuma, says they are up to 120 deliveries per week and reduce transport costs by about 15% compared to fossil fuel ones. Farmers like Danny Quizera says that gives them leverage in negotiating deliveries. The competition has increased and the people were not like having only uh, the, the, the power of negotiation relays to them only, but also on our side. The World Bank says only half the people in sub-Saharan Africa have electricity, while in the countryside, 70% are without power. So electric vehicles in rural Africa must be able to go long distances on a single charge. Ox Umume's chief mechanic, Innocent Mbonigaba, says new models arriving in Rwanda later this year will have better features for Africa's poor grids and roads. For example, battery range. This one can move more than 100 kilometers, 100 kilometers. So for the next ones, they will be double, like 300 kilometers without charging. And also, even we, we, we see the, how the suspension chassis and also other part, mechanical part, how it, how it is operating, even to our bad roads. A spokesperson at Rwanda's Ministry of Agriculture told VOA by phone that electric tracking of produce builds on their goal of farming becoming fully organic. Rwanda offers tax incentives that have attracted electric firms. Electric motorbike company Ampersand says taxi drivers increase their income by up to half with savings on fuel and repairs. So Rwanda has really set up the model for what uh, building the EV industry could look like in the region. Um, and I think a lot of other countries have, have, have seen the results here, have seen the progress that, that we have made and, and, and others, uh, and want to sort of replicate that in their, in their own countries. Uh, and so while uh, Rwanda is definitely sort of the, the furthest along uh, with, uh, with the sort of incentive pol the incentives and policies around e-mobility, uh, we do see other, other countries in the region coming up quickly. Ox Umume's operations manager Ferdinand Munzero says their electric tracking is not quite ready to expand in Africa. We are very excited to expand, but we can't expand till we, 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 we need to maximize the, the, the market that is available in Rwanda. We are still having people that are uh, staying like in the, uh, like that are spending a night on the road. So we are having a few vehicles and we are planning to maximize by bringing into more vehicles till we maximize that market, then we can go to other countries. Ox Umuma says they also plan to install refrigeration in their trucks to better transport fresh produce over long distances. Sana Anutor for VOA News, Kigali, Rwanda. Like its neighbors, Somalia and Kenya, southern Ethiopia is enduring the horn of Africa's worst drought in decades. Five consecutive rainy seasons have failed, and the one underway is expected to as well. The result is malnourishment of people and animals. After three years of failed rains, the animals in the southern Ethiopian village of Kura Kalicha are dying. Dozens of decomposing cattle carcasses lie on the parched earth. Jilawile, a local government official, fears the villagers will be next. We have over 100 people in critical condition and malnourished from starvation. This number includes children, elders and pregnant women. 
In Somalia, which has been hit the hardest, an estimated 43,000 people died because of the drought last year, according to researchers. No fatalities have been directly attributed to the drought in the Ormia region, where Kurakalicha is located, or the neighboring drought-affected regions. But humanitarian workers said it will not be long. Mm. Uh. Locals say assistance has been slow to arrive. Ethiopia's federal government and state media only began to talk about the crisis publicly last month when it issued a statement. Everyone agrees the available resources are inadequate. Last year, Ethiopia received only half of the $3.34 billion required for humanitarian needs, including the drought, but also the fallout from the war in the northern region of Tigray. Jilo Guracha, a 40-year-old mother of seven, walked 85 kilometers in the scorching heat to reach a camp where she and her sons could receive food rations. Some are committing suicide after failing to provide for their family. We plead with the government to stand by us, to save us from dying of hunger until God brings us. Her camp in the Dubolok district was set up a year ago in an empty field and now hosts 53,000 people who live in small huts made from grass and use plastic bags. According to the United Nations, nearly 12 million people are estimated to be food insecure in Ethiopia's drought-affected areas. The Basketball Africa League has been around since 2019. It's part of the U.S. National Basketball Association, or NBA, and expanding basketball into Africa with its first season in 2021. A new initiative is opening the way for women players as well. Sedina Abergay has the report from Dakar in this report, narrated by Salem Solomon. Adama Hawadiano has high goals for her career. She wants to play basketball around Africa and the world. The Basketball Africa League, or BAL, has set up the BAL for her initiative she says is perfect for her. I have challenges. I want to win everything and that's what I've been aiming for for a long time. To be queen of basketball, to be champion of Africa, to travel. That's what I really want. Ball Operations Chief says the program has two goals, to teach the game to women basketball players and to raise the profile of women players. This camp today is to provide an opportunity for the girls to have more visibility, to provide them with a little more material in terms of basketball, and off the field also, because they are going to do a basketball camp, then a seminar on nutrition and on women in sports. For many of these female players, it's not about comparing them to male players, but about access to opportunity, says Malian Amshiatu Maigaba, a professional women's basketball player. We can grow together and it's a pleasure to see these women who have opportunities, not only on a basketball court, but all around, because they have abilities and it's a pleasure to see them having the opportunity to demonstrate. After specific initiatives for women such as regional camps and the National Basketball Association Academy program for girls, the BAL leadership says they are looking to strengthen the place of women in sports. We will continue to produce talent at girls' level, and all these talents, when time comes, will be able to perform on the continent in a professional women's league that we will also continue to develop. The league has plans to add more camps and create space for women in the coming years. For Sedina Abagui in Dakar, Senegal, Salem Solomon, VOA News. Well, and that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Channels Television has our last word. We look forward to bringing you another show next week. To remember that ChannelsTV.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Joker Rogers. Thanks for watching and goodbye.